set up a few uh, exercises and uh, check it out for yourself. In cycles, uh, I have a number of exercises uh, and many of them are uh, pretty heavy, there are 33 exercises. So, I do not expect you to do these uh, immediately, but in the time that you have uh, today evening and tomorrow morning, if uh, at every center there are uh, at least 15, 20 people, if they do a division of labor and at least go through each problem and see lay it out. Do not do numericals that will take a lot of uh, time, but lay it out and see that uh, in they are confident of proceeding with the numericals that will be a job well done. I will now take questions. So, I am first going to JNTU Hyderabad. So, uh, Dr. Brahmara again, good evening and uh, any questions from your side, over to you. Good evening sir, there is one question from the participant Mr. Prasad, I hand over the mic to him. Sir, good afternoon sir, we will consider uh, isentropic process as a uh, ideal process, but in case of a uh, compressors, uh, the uh, work is uh, less than isentropic process, uh, the ideal work is uh, less than uh, in case of compressors, when compared to isothermal process and isentropic process, what is the reason sir, can you explain it? Thank you, over and out. You said over and out, so I assume that this is the only question that you had to ask. But anyway, the question asked is the work done in a compressor, when you do the compression isentropically is higher than the work done in the compressor, when you do it isothermally. In my opinion that the two uh, processes are not comparable because the end states are different. If your uh, requirement is to compress from say P naught ambient pressure, ambient temperature, compress the gas and if you want the compressed gas also at the ambient temperature T naught, that means the initial and final states are isothermal. Now you have a choice that either you do a direct isothermal compression in some way from state initial state to final state, in which case the compressor outlet is the state you want. In the second case you do first an isentropic compression, that means you will be increasing the temperature of the uh, fluid and then, then you will be cooling it back to the um, final state that you want. So, uh, naturally if you have to do cooling that means you have to extract energy and that means in the isentropic compression you have already added that much extra energy. So, this explains the difference, but you should not say that isentropic compression is more efficient than iso isotropic, you should not say that isothermal compression is more efficient than isentropic compression because the cases are different. When you do isentropic compression, then if you want to go back to a situation where you want higher pressure, but the same initial temperature, then you have to do cooling. So, that means you are taking a roundabout route and uh, if you want if you want that state, you go directly through isothermal compression, then you are directly approaching that state. So, the isothermal compression is a direct route, it will naturally consume less power than the isentropic compression and cooling which is a rather indirect route and hence will con, uh, consume. So now, let me go to some other center, KJ Somaya, Mumbai. Uh, Somaya, over to you. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, my question is, uh, we normally talk about constant pressure gas turbine like uh, based on Breton cycle, but uh, in some textbook I have seen constant volume gas turbine also. So, we normally does not talk about much about this constant volume gas turbine. So, please elaborate on this. Thank you. Over to you, sir. I have not come across an idea called the constant volume gas turbine because uh, if you have a flowing system, in a flowing system it is very, very difficult to create a constant volume process. Okay, so, this constant volume gas turbine is something which is uh, may not be an anathema, but uh, something which is uh, odd at the idea of a gas turbine. 
there may be something called constant volume gas turbine, but I have not come across anything like that. Over. No, sir. Actually, in classification they have mentioned, but they have not uh, given any uh, uh, description about that. So, in the book of uh, Mr. Professor Dumkundwar, I have seen that. Over to you, sir. Well, I have not seen that book, and if he had just listed it, he can list ten different things if he doesn't have to describe it. So, I don't want to comment anything more on that. Over to you. Any other question? Over and out. Uh, Valchan College Sangli, over to you. Hello, sir. Uh, my question is about Rankin with regeneration cycle. Uh, in that case, the process 2 to 3 and 6 to 3, uh, these are the mixing processes which should be highly irreversible. But we are shown with a continuous line. Is that approximation is good or not? Over to you. Yes, from a purely thermodynamic point of view, showing 2 to 3 and uh, that is the mixing process, you can only show by dotted line saying one stream goes in at 2, another stream goes in at uh, I think 6 and uh, the mixed stream comes, it out, comes out at 3. So, I think you are right, it should be shown only by dotted lines. Over to you. Sir, over and out. Uh, PhD Coimbatore, over to you, madam. Good evening, sir. I have two questions to ask, sir. First one is, um, in which engine the Ericsson cycle and uh, dual combustion cycle is practiced? And uh, the next one is regarding the Stirling cycle, that uh, you said that Stirling cycle is used for cryogenic refrigeration, whether it is used for um, liquefaction, liquefaction of gases to produce uh, cryogenic fluids like liquid, oxygen, helium, hydrogen like. Over to you, sir. Uh, I will answer the second question first. Yes, Stirling cycle, if not the basic Stirling cycle with minor modifications so that it can be implemented properly is used and is one of the workhorse cycles that is a mainstream cycles for refrigeration and one of the mainstream cycles for liquefaction of gases. So, whether you have uh, liquid nitrogen production or liquid oxygen production or liquid hydrogen or liquid helium production, a significant load of that work is done by implementing Stirling cycles. So, what you have said is right, the Stirling cycle is used for liquefaction of gases. The first question was that Ericsson cycle and dual combustion cycle. Uh, the uh, Ericsson cycle by itself is hardly ever implemented in practice, but um, I showed you I, and I mentioned that you can have a Brayton cycle with reheat, intercooling and regeneration. And I will leave it to you as an exercise to show that if instead of one reheat in which the turbine is split into two parts and you have one reheat in between, if you say that you split the turbine into a number of small parts and have small small reheats in between. Similarly, the compressor can be split into a number of small parts and have small small intercoolers in between and you have a regenerator. If you really implement this, it will be a complex scheme, but if you really implement this, then you are coming somewhere near the Ericsson cycle implementation. It becomes very complicated and that is why uh, an Ericsson cycle is usually or why it is hardly ever used in practice. About the dual combustion cycle, remember that the constant volume combustion in an auto cycle, the constant pressure combustion in a diesel cycle and the dual combustion cycle where partly you have at constant volume, the first you have at constant volume and then you have at constant pressure. These are approximate models for what actually happens in an engine. In an engine whether it is petrol, whether it is diesel or whether it is any other type of IC engine, the combustion does not follow any of these idealizations. Depending on the situation, one can approximate, for example, for uh, light fuels like uh, 
hydrogen, CNG, LPG up to petrol, we can say that the combustion is so fast that uh, you can you know reasonably approximate as a constant volume process. For diesel, whether it is a constant pressure or dual, that is a choice of detail, it is left to you. The actual thing is far, uh, look at an actual indicator diagram and you will find the actual thing is neither of the three, neither constant volume, neither constant pressure nor an appropriate mixture of the two. Okay. So, over to you. Any more questions? Uh, one more question, sir. Uh, we are using a trapezoidal diagram for representing compressor and turbine, sir. Is there any other uh, specific representation for pump or any thermodynamic devices? Over to you, sir. Uh, there is no standard as such. You know, we show an expanding trapezoid for a turbine. We show a reducing trapezoid for a compressor, because that is the typical shape of a, a gas turbine or a steam turbine or a gas compressor. For a pump, uh, usually you show that condenser, you have that sigma type of diagram, that also is a very common industrial practice. For pumps, either you show a circle with an arrow in it or circle in which the inlet pipe goes up to the center and the exit pipe, exhaust pipe comes as a tangent representing some sort of a centrifugal pump, but since here we are not saying that it is a centrifugal pump necessarily, circle with an arrow is good enough for a pump. For heat exchangers, etcetera, there is nothing really very special, so long as you create a very simple symbol which is understandable, I think that is good enough. These are anyway schematic block diagrams, these are not actual drawings of the equipment. Over to you. Over, sir. Thank you. Uh, K. K. Vag Nashik, over to you. Hello, sir. My question is on uh, isobaric heating and cooling in open system. You have shown that uh, isobaric heating and cooling happens only in open system. Why it is not in closed system, isobaric heating and cooling? Over to you, sir. Uh, I did not say isobaric heating happens only in the open systems and not in a closed systems. We have isobaric heating and cooling uh, examples in many of our exercises in closed systems. Okay. I said that it is easy to implement isobaric heating and cooling in an open system. All that you have to do is let the fluid pass through a pipe or a number of pipes, provide is reasonable area so that the velocity is low and the pressure drop is small because when a fluid is flowing through a pipe, there will be some pressure drop. right? So, see to it that the pressure drop is small, so that we can still argue that our process is near isobaric, if not exactly isobaric and then heat it up by you know burning something on the outside or making a another hot fluid flow on the outside, cooling cool it up by you know submerging that pipe in my another cold fluid, that is all I said. Over to you. Hello, sir. Another question is uh, when we extract steam at higher pressure, whether it results in uh, reduction in entropy generation? Over to you, sir. Uh, I think you are talking about the extraction cycle. Uh, I have not done the detailed calculation, but notice that since the overall efficiency increases. I expect the total entropy production of the cycle uh, to go down a bit, but I have not done detailed calculation. Maybe one should do it from that point of view and see exactly uh, how does the overall entropy production behave. Maybe there are some contributions which will go down, some contributions may go up, but my feeling is overall the entropy production is likely to go down because if you have the same source and the same sink and if you are uh, overall efficiency is going up, at least grossly that means on an overall basis entropy production should be going down. Over to you. So, one more question, uh, can you please explain us uh, in detail the throttling process which occurs in uh, refrigeration or 
uh, in expansion of stream uh, steam so i am going to nit trichy now may i request uh, every one of you including nit trichy to restrict yourself to maybe one major question so over to you nit trichy professor good evening sir uh, my doubt is about uh, temperature measurement by using constant uh, uh, volume gas thermometer uh, there uh, is given that uh, relation like theta is equal to 273.16 degree kelvin uh, into p by pt by putting uh, uh, reference state as a triple point of water and uh, he is calculating the uh, temperature of the saturated liquid at one atmosphere for different uh, uh, triple point pressure references he is plotted the uh, theta values and uh, he said that as the triple point uh, temp uh, pressure reference tends to zero uh, the temperature is uh, arriving at 373.15 degrees so is it possible means how should he is decreasing Can you provide me that reference from which you are uh, talking about? Over to you. Sir, uh, uh, from PK Naga, uh, I read this uh, information, sir. Uh, that is about constant volume gas thermometer. He said that as a limit PT tends to zero, okay. the theta is approaches to 373.15 degree Kelvin. Okay, I think what uh, Professor Nag is talking about is he showing the behavior of various constant volume gas thermometer. Remember that we talked only about the constant volume gas thermometer using ideal gas as a working fluid. And when you use various real gases as a working fluid, their behavior is not really ideal, but their behavior tends to be like an ideal gas when the pressure goes down. So, you work those thermometers at various pressures, lower and lower pressures and as you approach lower and lower pressures, as you approach zero pressure, that means very low pressures, the behavior of any gas will be like that of an ideal gas and hence that ratio which is shown there will approach uh, the 273.16 Kelvin ratio. Okay. I think uh, that should explain it. I do not have Professor Nag's book with me just now. But if you really insist, I will find it out from, uh, it is there in my um, uh, office somewhere. I will extract it and find out and we will discuss more about it. Over to you. Uh, hello, sir. One more question uh, regarding work ratio. Sir, you defined uh, work ratio as the work uh, consumed by the compressor or pump to that uh, work produced by the turbine. So, but uh, I uh, follow a book, Yunus Sanger, in that book it is specifically de uh, defined for the gas, tur uh, gas turbine that it is called as the back work ratio. Sir, tell me uh, what we should use, back work ratio or work ratio? Sir, is it same or different? Over to you, sir. It is the same. We may be calling it as a back work ratio. We simply call it work ratio. It is a slightly different term. It means the same thing. Let me go to NIT Calicut now. NIT Calicut, over to you. Hello, sir. Uh, my first question is: uh, My question is, this cycle has maximum pressure compared to auto, diesel, and dual cycle. And my second question is: Why dual cycle is called as limited color cycle? Over to you. As I understand, the first question was. Uh, which cycle has the maximum pressure, auto, or diesel or dual? Okay. Uh, difficult to ask because in, uh, in um, auto cycle, the maximum pressure is near the end of combustion, uh, but the compression ratio is small. So, end of compression, the pressure is small, but the instantaneous pressure at the end of combustion is pretty high. In case of diesel cycle, the uh, compression ratios are large of the order of 16 to 20. So, the pressure at the end of compression is high, but after that during combustion pressure may increase to some extent. So, uh, I think it will, uh, my guess is the two uh, things are comparable, uh, but diesel is likely to be a bit higher, but not much higher mm, uh, and uh, whether you can, I think you can always find out a uh, 
high performance petrol engine as used in maybe uh, F 1 racing cars, where the uh, maximum pressure may be higher than some other typical diesel or dual cycle type of engine. Uh, but I think generally it, they will be comparable, if at all diesel cycle may have a slightly higher pressure. Uh, the, I do not know what the second question was, can you ask it again please, over to you. Hello sir, uh, uh, in the first question sir, I asked uh, uh, in the reference to dual cycle also, auto diesel and dual cycle, I asked uh, so compared to diesel and dual, which is having more, more pressure, maximum pressure. See, the pressures and parameters of each cycle depend on its applications and for joule cycles, Brayton cycles, the pressure ratios are in the pressures are much lower than what you get in uh, auto and diesel cycles. But uh, otherwise, the cycles are not directly comparable to each other. So, the pressure ratios and maximum pressures are likely to be unrelated to each other. They will depend more on the application and the working fluid that is being uh, Truba College, Indore, over to you. What is the need of Breton cycle when we have Cornot cycle as an theoretical cycle? Over to you, sir. I think I mentioned that, that Carnot cycle is a theoretical cycle. It is very good for thermodynamic analysis, but it is very bad for implementation. Uh, that is because the, for a given uh, size, work output will be pretty low, even if you have everything ideal, because the mean effective pressure will be pretty low. And second thing, the work ratio is so horribly near one, that I doubt that a pure Carnot cycle will ever be operated in practice. And that is why we are looking for alternative cycles, and there are good alternatives, you know, Brayton, Otto, Rankin, and all these cycles are very good alternatives to Carnot, except that on paper they may not have uh, the same efficiency as Carnot for the same temperature limits. But the fact is that we are engineers, we want to finally have an engine which works and which is not exorbitantly costly. So, uh, you know, we will say that look, uh, with all due respects to Carnot cycle, which we will chew apart in thermodynamics when it comes to actual practice we will uh, work with Brayton, Rankin and other cycle as needed. Over to you. So, VNIT Nagpur, over to you. Hi, good afternoon, sir. Uh, our question is with reference to the Mollier diagram. Uh, we find that the isentropic expansion of 20 bar and 500 degree Celsius steam up to 0.1 bar and the isentropic expansion of 100, 100 bar and 500 degree Celsius steam up to the same pressure that is 0.1 bar results into almost a comparable enthalpy drop 20 bar 500 degree Celsius into 0.1 bar and 100 bar and 500 uh, C up to 0.1 bar is resulting into comparable enthalpy drop in kilojoule per kg. Uh, so, why should we go for high pressure turbines? Over to you. Sir. You are only uh, you are only looking at the enthalpy drop in the turbine. You should also look at the enthalpy which you need to, enthalpy rise which you need to provide in the boiler, calculate the efficiency of the cycle as well as the specific output and then decide what is good for a plant. And finally, remember that going to a higher pressure means a thicker equipment because uh, you have to have uh, pressure vessels and uh, pipelines that thick. Uh, but if it means more efficiency and more power output, that is an attraction. Finally, it is the economics of setting up and running the plant which decides. And from that point of view, today uh, there are one uh, uh, optimal or near optimal turns out to be around 150 bar and uh, um, 
roughly 570, 580 uh, degree C and there is another a rather costly optimum, but that is uh, at the uh, supercritical pressures, pressures of around the same, but sorry temperatures around the same, but pressures of roughly 250 bar. Attempts are being made to find out whether something like 350 bar, 750 degree C will be feasible, but those are still uh, you know design attempts. We do not have a working plant at those conditions today. Over to you. Point of view, who relates work output to the enthalpy drop, he would certainly ask uh, when 20 bar 500 steam is giving the same enthalpy drop as 100 bar and 500 degrees Celsius. Yeah, student may ask that, but ask him to do the complete cycle analysis and then uh, discuss this further. Okay. Over. I think that is the end for us today.